This interview is a culmination for me. Uh, it is a, a person who I have followed her career for a very long time. And essentially, like, it, I want to be Dr. Chivers when I grow up. <laughs> uh, Dr. Meredith Chivers is the research director at the Sage Lab at Queen's University in Ontario, Canada. This interview is right before Hurricane Ian. <laughs> it's kind of time travel -y for me as I have watched it back. I'm just like, whew, the world has turned upside down. Enjoy this interview with Dr. Meredith Shivers. I'll see you on the other side. Sex talk with Derek Miley. I'm not going to gush too much, but I have brought you one of my, one of the people I have looked up to for a very long time. Dr. Meredith Chivers is a research director at the Sage Lab at Queen's University in Ontario, Canada. Thank you for coming, Meredith. Thank you so much for having me, Erica. The first time I've ever saw any of your work and you were presenting about sexual identity and the physical responses and how the report of genital response could be similar for most humans. So like if somebody said, hey, yes, I'm primarily gay, when they would see gay sexual material, they their genitals would respond in kind. But there was a group that wasn't so much the case. Can yep. you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So this is research I've been doing for, oh, a couple of decades now. It just keeps getting so interesting and I, I can't stop. Heterosexual women, they were the odd ones out of, you know, all of the folks that we brought into the lab, uh, gay, lesbian, bi, queer uh, folks, straight men. All of those folks, when we show them a variety of different sexual stimuli that show partners that they want to have sex with, their genital responses and their self-reported responses tend to line up. But the group that we consistently see this sort of lack of synchrony is straight women. Puzzlingly, this isn't just something that happens with genitals either. This happens with how much attention people pay to different kinds of sexual cues when, when we use eye trackers to measure uh, visual mm. attention and a, a whole host of other kinds of measures, which really says there's something more bigger than just genital response that's going mm -hmm. on. There's something about even, you know, what we call non-preferred sexual stimuli that seems to trigger this physical sexual response. You were taught as scientists, you're always trying to disprove, right? Yes. You're trying to figure out conditions that are going to show that, you know, the kind of findings and conclusions you're drawing are not correct. And so mm. trying to falsify. How can and I be wrong? Exactly. Tell me how I'm wrong. I'm, mm -hmm. my, career, my career is devoted to figuring out just how wrong I am. A lot of the research that looked at this, you know, mind body relationship and in relation to sexual attractions or sexual identities, were using stimuli that were pretty potent, right? So these are like film clips of couples having sex, film clips, mm. we've used film clips of people masturbating, and um, we've used audio narratives. Of, that was my next question. Was yeah. it all visual stimuli? No, no, no. So narratives of, of folks having sexual interactions that are really carefully crafted to describe mm you the person acting on somebody else. Few studies now where we have used these kinds of stimuli, so there's no sexual activity happening, there's just a picture of some genitals or a picture mm. of a naked person and their aroused genitals. And what we find is these straight women do show specificity in their response. They start to distinguish yeah. in their genital responses. All of the other stuff that's in sexual films and stories is pretty potent. So the actual sex that's happening, the sexual activity that's happening, the relationship mm -hmm. between people, the, mm -hmm. you know, the sounds that people are uttering, like there's all these other contextual things over and above whether the, you know, the gender of the person depicted is whom you want to have sex with. Sexual meaning. Yes. Okay. Is this, we could come up with tons of reasons for the why, but I think about the cultural reasons specifically for women where heterosexual women there's a, there's there's a lot of limitations around sex yeah. whereas anybody with other identities sexuality uh, you have to be creative <laughs> like you, yes. you you it is a, essentially a requirement to be able to be creative sexually to be able to ask for what you need yes. pleasure wise but yes. heterosexual women would maybe with the lack of exposure. So they're making more sexual meaning. Absolutely. So that's sort of one way to, to go at it. And one of the things I've written about this difference. So why is it queer women are showing these patterns of response that really coincide with who they say they're sexually attracted mm. to? 
why is there just their self-reported sexual response and their genital response, something we call a sexual concordance, why is that more aligned? And so a couple of ideas, one has to do with sexual pleasure and the experience mm. of sexual pleasure. You know, there's great research out there that's documented a number of different samples that queer women report more experience when an enjoyment of sexual pleasure, whether yes. it's orgasm, other kinds of pleasure, way more so. This is the orgasm gap. Um, so there's the mm -hmm. orgasm gap between, you know, women and, and men, but it's, I'd qualify that and say that's straight women and straight mm -hmm. men, but there's also, an or, there's also an orgasm gap gap among women so queer women versus straight women queer women mm. are much more likely to experience sexual pleasure and so when i think about that and the relationship of um between sexual reward and mm. the experience of arousal and desire in women for mm. queer women that pathway is getting reinforced yeah. you know i'm turned on by someone i have sexual yes. desire i'm engaging in sex with them and then there's all this enjoyment and sexual pleasure and maybe orgasm that's part of the package yeah. for so many straight women that's not necessarily part of the package well and, and and if you come from a religious background oh you're you're fucked like you, <laughs> you need to be away from all sexual material you need to be like pull pull yourself from any sexual thought, or you might be the person causing someone else's sexual fallenness, right? Like there's a lot of reasons. There's so many reasons to be disconnected from their yeah. sexuality, right? So all of this cultural baggage, <clears throat> all of this interpersonal baggage. I mean, uh, I often think it is with with all of the forces that are working at women, particularly straight women, to not enjoy their sexuality. I often find it just remarkable how many women are sexual, experience sexual pleasure, seek it out yes. and make it a priority in their lives. When there's so many systematic barriers that have been placed in the way for, for women to have that experience. So coming back to the because I'm a big nerd, the scientific mm. model. Um, the, the, right. This model of, I uh, call it incentive motivation model of sexual response, the idea that we are mm -hmm. drawn to things that have been, this is the big science word about, incentivized, things that mm -hmm. have, have uh, an incentive associated with them, They've, you've experienced yeah. pleasure, you are now drawn to these people, these kinds of situations, because it's been associated with good things in the past. Carrot on a stick. Exactly. Right? And that, and that reinforcement. Mm -hmm from this incentive motivation model is going to feed back into the experience of sexual arousal and desire. So when you're confronted with the same kind of scenario or person or sex act or whatever it is, that you're going to have a bigger response to it. So okay. take st a step back and then you look at these patterns of sexual response. We've got mm. queer women who are differentiating between I like this and not this, mm -hmm. or, or I like this, but not this as much. That's usually what we see. It's not that people are never having sexual responses to things that are you know, so-called non-preferred. They're having right. bigger responses to things that are, are in line with their, their sexual interests. Then you've got straight women. They're not showing any differentiation. Maybe that's related to the fact that there hasn't been a lot of incentive associated yeah. there's been a lot of pleasure that's been associated with mm -hmm. um uh with sex for those women i i mean in fact there's many as we've talked about many barriers or even opportunities for for them to have been told like no this isn't for you um we even have jokes about it culturally where queer women are <laughs> like hey um you just quit having sex with men. Like yeah. there's literally jokes in culture there's right now. Problem. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, in this in this paper that that is, um, uh, it'll uh, what it'll probably be coming out actually, so people could read the whole thing in the ne next year or so. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, essentially, like this, if if a person is experiencing uh, PVI sex or uh, penis vaginal intercourse and or yeah. and any other sex act and they're experiencing pleasure and or orgasm they're more likely to want to continue to do that again and find that the genitals will start to maybe even sync up to that so uh, how do we tell everybody and especially all these damn penis owners like hey <laughs> yeah you want you want more sex pleasure is the key to it 
Yeah, well, that if, if only that message could be heard, right? Mm. I think it's getting transmitted. Um, I mean, I think I, I, I don't want to disparage all men who have sex with women. There's certainly mm. some, you know, great male partners out there who are mm. absolutely on board with giving all kinds of sexual pleasure. I mean, I think there's 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 all kinds of reasons where the you know where that gap comes from. Um, communication skill, mm. um, yes. and you know, I I think. For, for women in particular, you know, we talked about those cultural barriers to connecting with one's sexuality. I think women themselves need to know what turns them on. They need mm -hmm. to know their body to be able to coach somebody else. And here's what I want you to do. Um, and that's going to feel good for me. Yes. Being able to have the words to be able to describe it to someone else. And that, that understanding that our pleasure is our responsibility. Yes. And, yeah. and, and there, there are, of course, for men, there are different kinds of cultural barriers, yeah. different other, that messages that they've been told too. That is, I, I think I tell a lot of my clients all the time that in many cases for heterosexual relationships, when it comes to sex, it's a setup for failure. If you're told your whole life that you're supposed to always be ready for sex, have the biggest penis in the room, how are you supposed to get past that to then ask your partner yeah. what they, they, they might need? And then on the other side, not being encouraged to know what you need at all in any way. It's a setup. It, it, it is an absolute setup. It is. And I, and I, you know, I think there's also this myth that great sex is sex that happens spontaneously without people talking to one another. And, you know, I think we could all take a page from the kink community mm -hmm. where there's a whole lot of discussion that happens before anybody ever does anything. There are, you know, there are checklists. If you want checklists, there are checklists of the things you're, you will do that you won't do that you might do under certain kinds of circumstances. But the bigger point is there's a conversation, mm -hmm. there's many conversations, and there's also, you know, explicit discussion about consent to engaging in all of, you know, these different kinds of things. But I think so much, you know, anguish could be headed off at the pass if mm -hmm. those pre-sex conversations could become so much more normalized. And we could shed with this whole idea that, you know, the, the myth of, of having the partner who somehow through telepathy knows exactly how to give, you know, you sexual pleasure without ever talking about <laughs> is is really setting everybody up for a pretty disappointing experience right absolutely it yeah. is uh again it's a it's a setup i'm asking my clients all the time like did you get some psychic powers that i'm aware unaware of did you walk through some uh ninja turtle green ooze that you got some magic yeah. fighting powers I, I don't know like because it just doesn't work like that like you said yeah. so i i do think it, it what what do you think you would have told younger you what like, would i have you, told younger me if, if about pleasure today i mean you know in the united states for sure we have really shitty sex information mostly yeah. I, I mean it's getting better because of mm -hmm. people like us but the teenage you 20 year old you what do you what would you have told her about pleasure um, I mean, I think I was, uh, I was a really lucky teenager in mm. a lot of ways. Um, I think that, uh, I, you know, I was really connected with my sexuality and my sexual pleasure from a pretty early age. Mm -hmm. I think I was, I think what I would want to tell myself is, um, let go of the shame. Mm. Um, or the or the feeling that something is wrong or the taboo and just have at her don't fret this is all mm. you know this is all going to benefit you in the long run um i think so back you know that was in for me the 80s and the 90s mm. um i think uh i mean just if you think that there is a dearth of knowledge about women's sexuality now <laughs> Like, like back a few decades, things were pretty, it was pretty grim. Yep. Um, 
purity culture was running rampant through the 80s and 90s i absolutely know exactly what you're talking about yeah absolutely and you know when i first started on my sort of sex research sex uh you know focus on sexuality in my career road i was in my second year of my undergraduate um and taking a human sexuality course like everybody does mm -hmm. um and i had no expectations that this was going to be something you know earth shattering for me but one of the one of the assignments that we had to do was a presentation to the class and i decided to talk about inhibited orgasm and mm -hmm. um you know the experience of talking about women's sexual pleasure and the role of self-discovery and masturbation and mm -hmm. open communication and broadening the sexual repertoire from mm -hmm. just penile vaginal intercourse, which is most of the time not going to do it for a lot of um, straight women, mm -hmm. and witnessing the reception from my fellow students, um, as well as my teaching assistant and my professor, <laughs> it was so clear to me how challenging it was for people to hear but at the to hear this to be in a space where we're talking about something that's so taboo and yet so unbelievably hungry for that information mm -hmm. um you know that that class was was also you know i i vividly remember this moment of um our professor so this is um this was ed harold who who taught this class um, this is at the University of Guelph where Robin Milhausen is now. So I, mm -hmm. I don't you know mm -hmm. Dr. Milhausen anyways. Mm -hmm. So he, sh he would put up a picture of a vulva on, you know, this was back in the day. So it was overheads. Um, <laughs> there was no PowerPoint. And the, I can just hear the sound. I can hear yeah, the sound but, of putting the overhead Ooh, um, and right on there. Y'all who are younger don't know what an overhead sounds like. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's cumbersome we live in a wonderful digital age now but so here's this gigantic vulva up on the screen and mm -hmm. you know it's like 400 people in this lecture theater and um and all these people are going ew that was the first thing that came Ooh. out of people's mouths and i looked yeah. around and they were mostly women going ew i was expecting this to be mostly men mm -hmm. but it was women and i was like wow that's fascinating i never felt that way about my own body i feel badly for these folks that this is what they're um mm -hmm. this is what they're thinking but i think like a disarming the taboo and shame around that um you know clearly became so important i mean it's it's i can just hear them in my own mind as you're describing it repeating probably what they heard when they were tiny children exactly don't yeah. touch that ew it's dirty that's gross mm -hmm. yeah or the number of i mean at the time as well like discussion that came up after that the number of women who'd never even looked at their own vulva mm -hmm. i was just like i was just shocked you know one of the wonderful things my my mom did for me as a pretty young kid was you know sit me down on a mirror and show me my own body and walk me around and be like, okay, this is everything. And we didn't talk about what the clitoris was. She wasn't that progressive. Um, but I mean, still it was, it was, you know, I think I was really, really fortunate to have um, an upbringing that, that, that gave me access and connection to my body in a way that so many women don't get to experience from a young age open the door to curiosity from such a, a young age and allowed for you to be able to find that as you went. Yes. And I, uh, I, I hear you like it, it is this, it's the permission giving it's the, yeah. you, this is part of your body too. I, I was actually like right before we jumped on the call, I was somebody just sent me a TikTok. Of a, of a little one walking through, it was like a Target or some other store, and it's a mannequin, a mannequin, a, a supposed to be a male mannequin. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, where's the pants? It's a mannequin, and the kiddo <laughs> is just touching the pants yeah. of, of, of the mannequin, and the dad freaks out. Yep. freaks out at this little one who's just like interesting pants like just not probably not even crossing her tiny little she's probably three yeah and he's like that that's where that's where his pee pee is and i'm like oh what <laughs> you're giving this little little one a mannequin there's no 
That's not a no. That's not even a human. No, no, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just all of the messages, that. everything they get that's being transmitted in that moment, right? All mm -hmm. the information that kid is like absorbing yeah. about the taboo around what they're doing. Yeah. It's, have, I, I can hear I can hear it's like oh I'm tired now I'm yeah tired. well it's it just makes me sad right it's yeah. like there's there's more of that baggage that's yeah. more of what's gonna have to get worked out um, later down the road thank uh thank goodness for you thank goodness for the sage lab <laughs> thank you Meredith again hey folks thanks for sticking around to the end I know I squeed I will see you in two weeks